finish this part of the service by just saying, Jesus, you're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I live. Oh, wonderful. Let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, this morning we come again to your holy living and active word. And we ask that you would speak to us through it, please. Some of us may be thinking, ah, I wish we could sing more instead of listening to that each other people, Lord God, may think, well, no, maybe God's going to speak to me. Lord, you're a God of surprises. You're a God, Lord God, who knows the deepest, deepest yearning of every soul that's watching in. You know the deep needs, Lord God, in every life, in every house. Lord. And I just ask, Father, that you would surprise people today. By drawing near to them in the power of your Holy Spirit, ministering to them, Lord God, and bringing life into their spirit, please. Lord, may you speak to us today. May you help us, not just, Lord, to hear the word of God, but to receive it, to apply it, to live it, to walk in it, Lord, please. May that word transform us. May it help us to have a clearer view of you and a greater understanding of the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of your love for us. You are a wonderful God. And you're, Lord, the reason that I live. You're the reason that we live. It's only by your grace. And we thank you, O oh God, for the life that you have given us. May we live it to your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, last week we were looking at the Old Testament prophet Elijah and his challenge to the people of Israel. And the Israelites had been led away, led astray from worshipping the true and living God to worship a false god, Baal. And I emphasize a false god because all of the other religions of the world, whatever god that they are worshipping, it is a false god. There is only one true and living god and that is the god of Israel, the god of the Bible. And so the people of Israel were continually led astray and on this occasion, they were following after a, a false god called Baal, or who we would know as Beelzebub. And all too often when the Israelites turned from following the Lord, he graciously and he mercifully permitted various hardships, trials, pitfalls, even judgments that brought famine, pestilence, sickness, disease, captivity, or death to turn the hearts of the people back to him. At a showdown on Mount Carmel, Elijah, the prophet of God, challenged the people of Israel. How long will you falter, he said? How long will you limp? How long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Well, after a dynamic intervention by the Lord, the people of Israel turned back to the Lord and worshipped him, declaring, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And last week, I challenged Christians by asking, where is your heart today? Are you as in love with Jesus as you have always been? Do you love him more? Or perhaps has your heart turned away from the Lord? Has your heart and your love for God grown cold and you've drifted away from the Lord? Christian, is your heart steadfast in the ways of the Lord? Are you walking with him in obedience to his will? You see, it's no good saying, oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. If you think you can go out into the world and do your own thing. You're, you're fooling yourself. You're lying to yourself and you're not listening to the words of Jesus who said, if you love me, you will do what I say. I challenge backsliders by reminding them that the Lord is married to the backslider. And he will stop at nothing to have you return to him. I have watched backsliders in the past week. I have watched backsliders on Facebook putting up me posts on their thing and talking about how blessed they are. Blessed because they're living with their living partners. Blessed because they're partying away and not even social distancing and getting blocked. 
blessed because they're squelching left, right, and center. And they think that all of this is okay because I am blessed. Let me tell you something. God blessed Elijah when he was running away, but he brought him back. God blessed Jonah when he was running away and just spurred his life until he recognized that God had a purpose for him. And let me say to you, backslider, don't fool yourself into thinking that you're blessed and therefore your blessing, your blessedness is God recognizing your greatness and your love or whatever else and sort of overlooking your sin. God hates your sin. And if he chooses to bless you, that's the grace of God. But do not presume upon that grace because God will go to whatever length he has to go to. He will stop at nothing to bring you back. Let me ask you, what length do you think he will have to go to to bring you back? I challenge also unbelievers by asking them, what more does God have to do to demonstrate his love and his willingness to forgive your sins and accept you as his child? The Bible tells us God has demonstrated his own love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, while we were his enemies deserving of death and hell, Christ died for us. And therefore, to hear Elijah again, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But remember, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot be a friend of the world and say that you love God because friendship with the world is enmity with God. You can't walk with God and still hold hands with the devil. God is a jealous God who will do what is necessary to protect his name, to demonstrate his glory and turn the wayward hearts of his people back to himself. Well, this week... I've been thinking a lot about um, conspiracy theories around this whole COVID-19 pandemic. And see, Christians, they are the worst in the world. Christians are people, you know, they all rhyme off this verse, God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity and all that, but he has given us self-control and all that. The Christians are the worst in the world for spreading fear. They're, we're coming off with all of this nonsense about COVID-19 doesn't even exist according to some Christians. I wish that they would either get it, God forbid, or that they were taken up and walked through COVID-19 wards and seeing what the health service is having to put up with as they're watching person after person after person die. And thank God that the numbers are reducing. But Christians are the worst in the world for spreading fear among people, particularly around Conspiracy theories, there are so, so many of them. They range from the absolutely outrageous lunacy to others that make you think, mm, well, you know, maybe there's something in what's being said. When I first heard of the coronavirus, it wasn't long before all of the fanciful fantasies about its origin circulated. And many of these fantasies, many of these conspiracy theories, they really cause people mental illness. They cause people genuine fear and anxieties. And Christians should not be propagating that out into the world. They should be spreading the love of God, telling people of the love of God in Jesus Christ. God doesn't want people confused about what's going on in the world. He wants them to know that he loves them and he has demonstrated his love toward them in that while they were yet sinners, Christ died for them. There are many, many conspiracy theories. There's everything from the most exquisite oriental cuisine to preempted attacks by alien invaders. Maybe even David Icke has got it right that we're going to be attacked by the lizard people. Maybe it's the last day's judgments from the book of Revelation. Well, I can tell you now, categorically standing here today, that COVID-19 is not a last day's judgment being poured out. What about, well, it's, it's the Illuminati style group and they're implementing a universal population cult. Then we've been told, well, actually, it's not the virus that we need to fear. But rather, we need to be afraid of the vaccine. 
as it will be the mark of the beast. And all Christians therefore must refuse it because anyone who receives the mark will go to hell. What a load of oil cack. If there's a vaccine and I'm lying dying in a hospital ward and there is a vaccine made available that is going to bring me back to life so that I can serve the Lord for whatever number of days he has a portion of me on earth, trust me, I'll be putting forward my arms and say, go ahead there and check me. Because the Bible teaches that in the last days, the people of God are already sealed by God before any marks of the beast come. So if you are a member of the body of Christ, if you are a Christian born again by the spirit of the living God, God has already put his seal upon you. So you don't need to fear about, oh, getting the mark of the beast and I'm going to go to hell. Do you know that we've also been told that it's not the virus that's going to kill people, or it's not even a virus that is killing people, but rather it's the 5G network. Oh, Kurt, switch off my phone back to 4G so that the 5G can't catch me. Or perhaps it's a bioweapon with DNA genetic engineering and it's used by China to win a world war by causing economic collapse. I wonder if you've heard any of these conspiracy theories. I heard a cracker yesterday or the day before it was sent to me, and it was allegedly Bill Gates, one of the richest men in the world, and he was supposedly giving this presentation to the CIA, and it was all about the brain, and you know the way the brain's all separated into the different functions, and different parts of the brain do different things. There's one, part, one person once said, I would rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. The, 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 the brain works in mysterious ways, and what he was saying in this thing is, that there's a part of the brain that makes person, people a religious fanatic. And he says, this vaccine, if they take it, will deal with that part of the brain so that they'll not feel the need to worship and they'll not feel the need to uh, be fanatical about worshipping a God. So you can imagine the fear of people like, oh, well, I'm not taking the vaccine because I'm going to lose this part of the brain that's going to stop me loving Jesus. Well, let me tell you, even if that happened, let's say that really happened and we were all taken and given us injected and we all suddenly had this type of religious frontal lobotomy. Jesus ain't going to stop loving us. And that's the thing, because even if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Have you heard any of these conspiracy theories? I wonder, do you actually believe any of them? Well, anyway, while I mulled over some of these theories, I found myself becoming very, very spiritual. I found myself almost being lifted up into the third heaven and I started to think very biblically and very religiously and very spiritually about pickled peppers. Or to be more precise, pickled baby chilies. There is nothing like pickled baby green chilies to keep you focused and bring you back to planet Earth when conspiracy theories take you on mind-boggling Journeys. When you're drifting away in one of these stupid conspiracy theories, just put one of them wee pickle baby green chilies under your tongue, and within seconds, trust me, you're back in planet Earth. Well, of course, as many or any Christian evangelist might do, I thought, how could I spiritualize these two wonderful ingredients, COVID-19 conspiracies and pickled chilies, into a gospel message? Well, I'm going to read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and the first nine verses. The Apostle Paul is writing and he says this. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sophonies our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. That you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who will also confirm you to the end, 
that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Apostle Paul is writing to Christians in this city called Corinth in Greece, where he had sometime earlier established a church. And he gives insight into the various problems in this letter. It's incredible some of the problems that this fledgling church uh, was experiencing. And he shares his wise counsel and some of his words of discipline with the Christian believers. And the first thing that I want to point out this morning is this. There is no such thing as a perfect church. There is no such thing as a perfect church. If there is, it just requires you or me to walk into it. And then it's imperfect. There's no such thing as a perfect church. There is no such thing as a perfect Christian. I know people think that I'm almost there for sinless perfection, but I'm not. I feel God every day of the week, but I mourn over my sin. I grieve over my sin. I hate the sinfulness of my sin, and I yearn for the day when God will set me free, and that will only happen in death. Undoubtedly, some churches, even some Christians, they think they're more perfect than others. It's a bit like Animal Farm, you know, all people are equal, except some are more equal than others. So there are some churches, even some Christians, who think that they're more perfect than others, maybe because they only preach out of the King James language, or maybe because they only speak in a certain way, or maybe because they get so much money or whatever, but there are these churches and there are these Christians who think that they are more perfect than others. But the church, the church, the only church that matters, the church of which Jesus Christ is the head, the church which belongs to Jesus, consists of sinners saved by grace. See, if I was to stand here and say, I'm a sinner, then I wouldn't be saved. Because if I wasn't a sinner, there would be nothing that I needed saved from. And if you're saying today that you're not a sinner, well then you're never going to be saved, you're going to hell. Because if you don't recognize that you're a sinner, you're never going to recognize the need to be saved. The church that Jesus is the head of, the church that belongs to Jesus, consists of sinners saved by grace. Christians are, according to the word of God, they are in the process of being made perfect. But they won't attain it until they are with Jesus. They will never reach sinless perfection this side of heaven. And even though Paul the Apostle writes of those who are sanctified, that means be holy, those who are sanctified in Christ, who are called to be saints, he is not suggesting that any Christian, that any believer is sinless or perfect. However, he makes clear that every person in every place, whether you're in Listen Green, whether you're in Whitehill, whether you're in Kilcoolie, whether you're somewhere else this morning listening to the Word of God on Facebook here, God's Word is clear. And Paul emphasizes this, that anyone in any place whatsoever, every person in any place who calls on the name of the Lord is sanctified in Christ Jesus and is called to be a saint. In other words, from the Lord's perspective, those who trust in Jesus are holy and blameless in God's sight. But I want to pick up on something else that Paul is saying here. He tells the Corinthian Christians that by God's grace in Jesus, they have been enriched. What a beautiful thing that he's telling them. He said, your life is now enriched beyond anything that you could possibly imagine. The born-again Christian is rich beyond all of the wealth of this world. When you know what it is to have all of your sins forgiven, when you know what it is to be adopted into God's family, when you know that nothing in this world in any way is going to take you away from God because God's word says nothing, nothing will separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ, not even death. When you go through this life knowing that whatever may be false you, God promises you, he's going to turn it all around for the good. Then you know what it is to be enriched by God's grace through faith in Jesus. And this is what Paul is saying to these people. He's telling them that by God's grace in Jesus, 
they have been enriched. And true riches, pardon me, true riches are not found in wealth or health. I see it a little bit was up, it's usually Christians put it up. Health is your wealth. Nah, I don't think so. Health is not your wealth. True riches are not found in wealth or health. They're nice things and they indeed at times are blessings. But true riches are found in Jesus. And Paul reminds these believers that the testimony of Christ, that means the good news about Jesus that they believe, he tells them this, that it was confirmed in them. This is so important. The term that Paul uses for confirmed speaks like this. I want you to imagine a professional jeweler fixing a ring, putting a ring, he's made a ring, and he's now setting the most precious diamond into that ring. That's confirmed. And what Paul is saying here is this. When he speaks of confer being confirmed, he says, he speaks of being steadfastly set, made firm, and so reliably so as to warrant security and inspire confidence. This is what he is saying to the believer. Because you have believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, because you have become Christians and God by his grace through Jesus has enriched your life. He has confirmed you. He has steadfastly set. He has made firm and so reliably so as to warrant security and inspire confidence. Every person who calls on the name of the Lord, who becomes a born again Christian, is not only sanctified in Jesus and called to be a saint, but they are so absolutely, steadfastly secure in the love of God that it should inspire them with confidence to live lives that glorify him. Why do you think in the history of the church, when men and women were being taken out because of their faith in Jesus to be burned at the stake, that they went out singing hymns, that they went out praising the Lord, that they saw the flames coming up around them and they worshipped the living God because they knew that they were steadfastly set, that they were made firm so reliably so as to warrant their security and inspire confidence that even in the midst of the flames they would worship the living God who had enriched their lives with his grace through faith in Jesus. Oh, how beautiful is our God. When a person believes the truth of the gospel, when the person believes God's good news about Jesus coming into the world to die to pay the price for our sin, when a person believes that there is forgiveness with them for God if they will repent of their sins and come and put their trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone as their Lord and Savior, that truth, that truth of the gospel is so deeply rooted into their lives that the grace of God fills their lives and they are steadfastly set, made firm, so reliably so to warrant security and inspire confidence that they are eternally secure in the love of God. It doesn't matter what this world says or does. Of course there's no such thing as a perfect church or a perfect Christian. And although Christians are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints, we haven't attained our perfection yet. If you see me at times and have lost the rag over something or you hear me swearing, sometimes I think my neighbours hear me swearing, or somehow that I let God down, just remember, it's not a, oh, I look at him, some Christian. It's, boy, look at him, hasn't reached perfection yet because it's not going to happen this side of heaven. But every Christian knows their struggles with indwelling sin. See the Christian who's not struggling with indwelling sin. They're not a Christian. It's a label that they've attached to themselves. They may as well have put Kellogg's cornflakes mm -hmm. on their forehead. If a person calls themselves a Christian and they are not battling against indwelling sin in their life, they are not a Christian. So therefore, every Christian, every born again child of God knows their struggles with indwelling sin. They know the accusations of the enemy of Satan, the devil, 
They know and they can see the pointing fingers and the accusing tongues of unbelievers. But if you are in any doubts about what Paul is driving home here, let me tell you, he tells us something even more wonderful in verse 8 of this passage. Paul says, Jesus, please listen to this, Christian. Paul says, Jesus will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. See all that's going on on the day of Jesus, you will be blameless. Those who struggle with indwelling sin, those who seek to walk in holiness but fall a thousand times a day, there's a day fixed when you will be presented before God holy and blameless in the Lord Jesus Christ. But did you notice in that verse, Paul says, Jesus will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's that word, confirm again. Jesus will also confirm you to the end. In other words, those who commit their lives into the hands of Jesus, he will keep them in his love until all is accomplished. Don't matter what Bill Gates or anybody else says about vaccines. Jesus will keep those who commit their lives into Jesus' hands, he will keep them in his love until all is accomplished. But this time, I want to tell you what the word confirm actually means. It signifies in our language. It signifies confirming a person's salvation. It's confirmed. It can't be changed. It is confirmed. But it means this. It means more than that. It means preservation in the state of grace. Did you hear that? Present preservation in the state of grace. See, my tasty baby green chilies, they're kept in a pickle jar and they're preserved in vinegar. But those who trust in Jesus, born again Christians, they are preserved in a state of grace. Christians are pickled people. We are preserved in a state of grace until all is fulfilled, until every promise of God becomes our present reality. God is faithful, and he will do this. Jesus will confirm to the end all who have trusted in him that we may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's like as if Jesus has opened up a pickled chili jar, or he's opened up a pickled onion jar, and he's poured out the onions, and he's filled the jar with his grace, and then he's just plucked you right in and put the lid on, and no one can open it. And then the Bible says, when the God closes, none can open. And when he opens, none can shut. And you born again Christian, you are pickled in God's grace. You are kept in a state of preservation in God's grace. All the conspiracy theories in the world about COVID-19, vaccines, 5G network, last day's judgments, the mark of the beast, alien invasions by the lizard people or, or anything else. Suddenly they become nothing more than silly, silly conjecture, chewing gum for the mindless or at best subjects of little or no interest or importance when a Christian realizes that they are a pickled person preserved in God's grace. Nothing is going to harm you. Nothing is going to take you away from the love of God in Jesus Christ. You are preserved. So Christian, I'll drive it home again. You are kept by the power of the Lord. And he is going to finish what he started. All his promises to you will be fulfilled. Don't get caught up in the nonsense of conspiracy theories or trying to work out God's roadmap to the end of the world. Just be confident that you are absolutely 
steadfastly secure in the love of God and let that truth inspire you to live your life to the glory of God, walking in obedience to him and to his will. Even if you fall a thousand times a day, by his grace, get up and press on and press yourself into Christ. Because remember, you can't walk with God and still hold hands with the devil. Maybe this morning, someone watching in and you're not yet a Christian. Well, I need to let you know what the Bible says. The Bible teaches that outside of Jesus, not being a Christian, outside of Jesus, you can have absolutely no confidence that you will get to heaven. No matter what you think. If you think everybody dies and goes there, you're wrong. Outside of Jesus, you can have no confidence whatsoever that you will get to heaven. This is the word of God, not the word of Tyler Gordon. This is the word of God. Outside of Jesus, you are not preserved in God's grace, but rather because of your sin, you are reserved for God's judgment. The Lord, in his grace and in his mercy, has demonstrated his love for you. The Lord has provided the only means by which you too can be sanctified, be called to be a saint, and that is through faith in Jesus, his son. There is no other way. Don't fool yourself into thinking of heading into a church will do it. Getting confirmed in a church will do it. Infant baptism, that won't do it. There is no other way, no good works, nothing will get you into heaven. It is only through faith in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And therefore this morning, I urge you please to confess your sin. That means agree with God. Not long and tell a priest all the things you've ever done wrong. It's not long and tell me all the things you've ever done wrong. Confess your sin means agree with God. When he says you're a sinner and you need to be saved, agree with God that you are a sinner. Your own conscience tells you you are a sinner. Agree with God that you are a sinner. Repent, that means turn around and turn away from living your life that sinful way. And receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because only then will you become one of God's pickled people, preserved in His grace to spend eternity with Him. And on that day, Jesus will present you before the Father, holy and blameless in His sight. Heavenly Father, this morning, thank you for the wonderful truth of your word. That in Jesus, we are confirmed. We are so steadfastly set, so eternally secure in your love. That, Lord, we know with confidence that on the day of judgment, we, Lord God, will be able to be presented before you, holy and blameless in your sin, all because of Jesus. Lord, may every Christian search their hearts and ask themselves, has my heart strayed from the Lord? Have I forsaken my first love? Have I lost that zeal for Jesus? Have I lost that sense of awe that once inspired me when I looked with the eye of faith to his face? And may you, Lord God, cause all of us to search our hearts as Christians and to renew, Lord God, to rededicate our lives to you, that we might live in the confidence of this truth to the glory of God in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, that you would help us to understand that we're a pickled people. We are pickled, Lord God, in your grace. We are in a state of preservation in your grace, and you're going to fulfill every promise that you have made concerning us. Let that inspire us, Lord, to live lives in humble obedience to your will, putting away sin, taking up our cross daily, denying ourselves and following you, that we might honor you in all that we do. Lord, let us not get carried away with nonsense conspiracy theories. Let us not be overwhelmed with anxieties and fears, Lord God, about the future, but let us place our futures into your hands. You who are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, 
Help us, Lord, to just yield to you and trust our lives into your care. Lord, I pray that every Christian would rejoice in the truth that we are picked people because they're in grace. And Jesus has promised that he's going to present us before you, holy and blameless in your sight. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I ask for the unbeliever today that you would so graciously, so mercifully permit whatever is necessary to come into their lives to bring them, Lord God, to that place of crying out to you for salvation. That they too, Lord God, may be brought into the family of God, be pickled in your grace, preserved in your love, kept by your power, until that glorious day when they too shall be made perfect with all other believers in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask that you would think of the backsliders today, Father, particularly these ones who brag about being blessed when they're willfully walking in sin and presuming upon your grace. God, have mercy upon them because although, Lord, in my belief, a Christian, a born-again Christian is eternally secure, what if I'm wrong? I don't think I am, but Lord, they should not presume upon the grace of God. If they call themselves a Christian and they are not, Lord God, experiencing the struggle of indwelling sin, there's something wrong. Oh God, convict them, please. Bring them to repentance and restore them again to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. And may you help us all, Father, please, to realize that you will go to whatever length you need to go to to draw those that are yours onto yourself. And so today, Father, we yield to you in Jesus' name.